The Compliance Life details the journey to and in the role of a Chief Compliance Officer. How does one come to sit in the CCO chair? What are some of the skills a CCO needs to successfully navigate the compliance waters in any company? What are some of the top challenges CCOs have faced and how did they meet them? These questions and many others will be explored in this new podcast series. The Compliance Life is hosted by Tom Fox, and each month he'll present the story of one CCO through four episodes. The Compliance Life is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network. This month I am joined by Katie Smith, the Vice President of Ethics at Assurance. Over this four-part podcast series, we take a look at why a liberal arts degree and not a JD make a successful CECO, how today's compliance professional can help the next generation of compliance professionals going forward. In episode three, we take up the difficult question of when is it time to move on? And in our closing and final episode, episode four, we take a look at personal lessons from COVID-19 for compliance professionals. This is a fascinating series. You will learn a lot and enjoy it quite a bit. Katie is well known within the compliance profession, having been the CECO at Conversant before she moved over to Assurance. And she's got a lot of insights from her 20 years plus in the compliance profession. The Compliance Life is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, uh, back again with Katie Smith, uh, this month's guest for The Compliance Life. And today is our final episode, and we are going to take a look at some of the lessons for compliance practitioners from COVID-19, the economic dislocation, and uh, the insanity that is called the year 2020. So, Katie, first of all, welcome back. Thanks, Tom. Thanks for having me. So uh, I wanted to maybe start with how would you characterize the life of a SECO, Katie? Oh, chaos, right? (laughs) Um, You know, ethics and compliance has its own rhythm and cadence of crazy board reporting, uptick and helpline calls during the full moon. I I know (laughs) I just experienced that last week. Um, Lots and lots of business travel. And so we have these these seasons of frenetic activity. Um, And it's easy to get caught up in that frenzy. And while most of us preach about the importance of a proactive program, I think the nature of the beast still has a lot of react built into it. Um, and it's in, in that frenzy, is, it's easy to lose sight of what matters, which is health, family, friends, and life balance. Um, and, you know, let's be honest, it's a stressful, lonely job. And chances are most of us lean on some kind of a bad habit, whether it's alcohol, that extra piece of chocolate, or, or skipping the gym. <laughs> um, you've spoken about self-care and uh, why that's important to, frankly, the sanity of a, of a chief compliance officer. But it really strikes me, Katie, that it's more than just keeping sane. It's keeping you uh, at your best so you can deliver your best to your company as the compliance professional. Yes. Um, you know, like they talk about it from an executive level perspective that, you know, um, people that are leading the company need to be in top health so that they can, they can be strong. Um, and, and I think it's, it's the same for ethics and compliance that we have to be, um, we have to be sharp in, in feel, um, strong mentally and physically, um, because, Like I said, our jobs are stressful and we have to be able to think on our feet and, and work through very tough situations. And we work in, even when it's not 2020, we work in very dynamic, um, work situations. And so that, um, that need for health is so important, not only physically, but also, um, just our brain function to be able to, to do our job well and be successful. Uh, Katie, one of my observations about the COVID-19 health crisis is that 
uh, it brought a speed of change almost exponentially uh, from things that have been percolating along uh, trends sort of in 2018 or 2019. And when sort of March 15th hit and we all got shut down, uh, change accelerated greatly. Uh, there's a lot of people who are afraid of change. There are a lot of people who have difficulty with change. But uh, I've, one of the things I've heard you say are opportunities. Uh, go towards an opportunity. Look at an opportunity. If a door opens, presents itself and opens, uh, take a look at what's on the other side. So I really wanted to get your perspective on um with the changes wrought after March 15-ish, uh, what are some of the opportunities you've seen for compliance to change? Yeah, so for me personally, um, during the first month of the pa- pandemic, we'd all gone to work remotely. And with the lockdowns and the fear of, pan- of the pandemic and, and really the unknown, you know, back in March, we didn't know if we were all going to die. Um, there was a brief time where, the whole world just kind of slowed down and especially work. And it was really quiet. Um, I was in a a relatively new role. I'd I'd been in the position for a few months. So it was a perfect time for me because I was in program build mode and um, I didn't have the extra noise of, of extra meetings and business travel and conferences Um, and helpline calls had dropped. So it was an opportunity for, for me to really focus on um, building our program. So I capitalized on that. Um, And, you know, I think it's an opportunity for all of us as practitioners to think about um, even now, I mean, we're, the situation is fluid and it's evolving. And so, so should our programs, Um, you know, we should step back and think about Um, what makes sense and what really matters. Um, The reality is most of us are going to face some kind of budgetary constraint next year, whether it's not being able to hire that extra person for our team or our budgets are getting cut. We're being asked to do with less next year, probably. Um, So it's a great opportunity for us to go back to our programs and actually to the larger business and say, okay, what doesn't make sense anymore? Are there, are there processes or policies that, that are, aren't relevant? What, how can we do things differently, especially now that our workforce is different, where we, ha- we will probably most, I would say a lot of companies will never go back to 100% to the way um, office um, life used to be. So how do, we, how do we pivot as an ethics and compliance program? You know, this now is the time to be planning for our, you know, our three-year strategy from here moving forward. How are we going to train our our geographically separated employees? Most of them virtual. Some of them probably will never step foot in an office. So how do we engage them and indoctrinate them into the culture? How do we how do we make sure we have the right controls in place now that we we are operating virtually? Um, how do we communicate with, with the, our employees in exploring those um, innovative new ways of doing that, I think is, is really what's going to set um, the ethics and compliance programs apart from each other from a, from a success. I guarantee you, when we go to a conference in two years and we're talking about best practices, what organizations have done now to to respond to this, this rapidly changing world will we'll set programs apart. A great example is virtual investigations. Um, so many of us have, you know, we've never had to do that before, but now we're having to conduct interviews with key witnesses over Zoom. Well, that's not a skill that we, we've taught at any conference in the past, um, but we're learning on the fly. Um, there are things like that that have, co- dynamically changed this year that we haven't experienced in the past. So Katie, um, we are near the end of this episode and indeed this podcast series. And I was wondering if we might take a few minutes to go to that veiled land of the future and and engage in some speculation, Um, kind of wrapped around what advice you might have for the compliance practitioner, maybe someone at your level, also someone who's who's newly 
coming into the field. Where do you see him see us in 2025 and beyond? Uh, through innovation. Um, I think we'll continue to, those of us that are successful in our roles will be continuing to demonstrate that we are a true partner to the business. Um, now that we have so much more data in our hands that, um, that we can use to strengthen the program and strengthen the business, um, being able to share that and be transparent, I think that's, um, that's the future of the, of the, of the role. Um, but really, I think it, it goes back to being flexible and innovative. I, I think it would be short-sighted to say that when we get out of 2020, we can put this crazy year in the past and go back to normal. I think we're, we're going to be in a, a state of uncertainty for a while for a number of reasons. And, and so we have to get creative and, and think about innovation um, from a training and engagement perspective um, because this virtual world will not change. Recently, I saw a quote that I think is brilliant for this conversation. When you can't control what's happening, challenge yourself to control the way you are responding to what's happening. That's where the power is. And I think that's where the, the SECO power is for the future. Well, Katie, unfortunately, we are at the end of our time for this episode, but I, I wanted to thank you so much. I've wanted to do this with you for a long time. I knew you would have a, a great uh, podcast series for us. And I think that a lot of uh, compliance practitioners are really going to be able to utilize a lot of uh, what you talked about. So thanks again. And I greatly look forward to continuing the conversation. This concludes our four part podcast series of the V compliance life with Katie Smith. I hope you'll join me again in the month of December for another series. Thanks again for listening. The compliance life is a production of the compliance podcast network. I'm very excited about another special podcast series on the Compliance Podcast Network, where I'm joined by Mikhail Ryder Gordon, Managing Director at Affiliated Monitors, where we take a deep dive into the Wirecard case. We're up to 10 episodes. Check it out on the FCPA Compliance Report and Compliance Podcast Network.